of it is almost monotonous. The coding inside the brush. He started to create a new framework which allows introducing programming techniques to PHP. Robert Lennon. Thank you. And thank you for staying here or oh, coming to my talk. Um, so, yes, this is uh, about PHP uh, for enterprise applications, but it's also uh, about PHP for any other purpose, uh, as long as you're interested in some quality and flexibility and probably also uh, face some complex projects. So, uh, what I found interesting uh, for, for this venue, I'm really happy to be here despite uh, you probably don't hear me or see me moving my mouth like this. But anyway, um, your view actually is a developer. That is good. And uh, who's allergic to code? Anybody? Because I will show some code. Um, who's uh, not a PHP developer? It's also good because you might switch to PHP. Uh, I try to convince you at least. So, Flow 3, uh, which you see uh, in some of the screens here, uh, this is the name of a new framework. And um, I will also appear on, on that uh, picture. Actually, there's also a symphony called Oliver in that picture. So, well, my name is uh, Robert. I am working full time in the Typo 3 project. Uh, Typo 3 is a content management system and also one very old um, open source project which, uh, with a very nice and friendly community. It exists uh, about 11 years already. And my mission there was my personal chosen mission was uh, to modernize the whole uh, code and the, the developing, uh, development techniques we're using. So this is how I ended up here. And if you tell someone nowadays that you're using PHP, especially now that everything is so agile and so, um, you know, so no JS and everything, um, you sometimes really have to defend yourself that you're still using PHP because PHP is, is, is um, known to be a chaotic toolbox of uh, inconsistent functions and it's not really you know, object oriented, it's not especially not suited for uh, these so called enterprise projects. Um, they're, they're using Java, and Java in turn has. Um, well, what do you think about Java? Is there any Java developer here? Are you a Java developer? Who did it outside university actually? <laughs> That's the difference. Um, and so Java developers have, you know, they say about Java developers that they tr tend to over-engineer everything and it's not really agile, it's so bloated and so in the end you choose yet another programming language which has other problems. Um, well, the point is um, when I uh, worked on more on Type 3 and also the new framework, I asked myself, is PHP actually a good programming language or not? And it has these inconsistencies and um, it really is that toolbox I, I said, but the point is uh, kind of what I learned from it that the programming language itself is not really the problem. You can do really cool things with a bad programming language and you can write awful code with a very good programming language and that happens all the time. So this is why, why I actually state in the project, also we have a huge community who knows PHP already, and there, I mean, there, there are some other companies like Facebook and Yahoo and um, uh, Mailchimp. They use PHP uh, every day, so it can't be completely wrong. So, I still love PHP, or probably I, I'd rather say I like PHP. Um, I, it's it's kind of an old marriage we have. Um, but what always nagged me was um, that I had to do so much manually uh, when I program some web application. I had, had to care about so many things like security and how to handle my file uploads, how to handle files uh, in general, how to handle sessions and all that. So um, these, are, these are tasks which you do again and again 
and I wanted to focus on, on the fun parts. So I'm really, what keeps me programming is getting to know new clients and trying to understand their world and trying to understand what software problems they might have for me. So this is the mission of the Flow3 framework. It tries to give you back the joy of programming and uh, lets you try to focus on the essential parts, on the problem your customer really has or on the fun project you want to solve in your community. Right. So, uh, um, in order to... Or who has used any, any framework yet? Who has worked with a framework? Thanks for raising your hair, uh, hands. Um, who has created a framework? Two frameworks? CMS? Anybody? No? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, just that you have a comparison with other frameworks you might know already, I want to give you um, a roller coaster overview of some features of Flow3. And uh, that are 10 features, which means we have like 2.3 minutes per feature. And they are quite complex features and involve code, so you try to focus. Um, they are quite exciting. Well, so the, the first feature I want to show you is in Hello World example. Um, and we are using the model view controller pattern in Flow3, which is, should be known to you, hopefully, um, if you didn't live under a rock. Um, so model view controller is really handling any incoming request. Could be uh, a web request from outside from a browser, but could also be a request from the command line. And in the old days, also in Typo 3, we had one file where we handled the application flow, the whole logic. Uh, we did database queries and then uh, actually rendered some HTML, everything in one class, in one file. And Model View Controller asks you to, no, urges you to split up um, that logic into Model View and Controller, of course. So if you want to handle and access um, a request in Flow3, I hope you can read the code fine now. Um, what you have to do is you write a controller, and that is usually an action controller. So um, when, when I ask my website to do something, it's usually an action, uh, like show me something or create something, delete something. In this case, it's a greet action, and I um, enter some URL. That greet action is actually be called and returns a simple string, and that would be the hello world example. So if you put that into a browser, um, there's some URL up there which tells Flow3 which controller to choose, which action to choose, and then you actually have um, your output. That is really fancy, right? Um, well, so you can do more fancy stuff, of course. Uh, if you want to also pass a parameter to that script, uh, to that action, you just use um, the built-in uh, mechanisms of PHP. That is a very important um, key principle in Flow3. We don't want you to write a lot of configuration. We want you to just code PHP. And if you write a method which has an argument, a parameter, uh, there's no need to um, configure that parameter at some other point again because uh, Flow3 can read that code as well and uh, see that you also used um, some proper documentation and said this is a string, so Flow3 can do some validation. So it's, it's really sufficient that you just write your PHP code and when you run that same URL again, you get some exception. Uh, this would be the development mode, which says uh, this required argument has not been passed yet. And as soon as you do that through some get query parameter or post parameter, then of course you get uh, the output of that action again. So uh, passing strings to an action is a very easy thing. Um, and every other framework can do that. But we love to work with objects. Flow3 is really object oriented and tries to hide uh, the database from your code so you really can concentrate on, on the object world. 
And now, if you want to call this action again and don't want to pass a string as a parameter but an object, um, there is some mechanism in Flow 3 which can convert everything you send through the web browser, a post request, a form maybe, into an object or into big structures of objects. And you can configure all that, how that conversion should happen. But you mostly don't have to. So if, you, if we take that action again, we have this greet action, but this time the argument is not a string, but a person object. So in order to call that action, uh, Flow3 needs to convert your HTTP request into a person object, the arguments of your HTTP request. And it just does that. Um, if you specify uh, the, the properties of that person, so the name and phone number, etc., as a kind of array, usually that would end up as an array in PHP, but Flow3 knows you expect a person, so it tries to convert that array into a person. So that is just, you know, a quick uh, glimpse on, on what, what's happening there. You can do lots of complex stuff with it, but just that, you know, we try to keep you from writing configuration. We don't like XML files and all that. Well, um, HTTP is really the foundation of everything we're working on, but um, honestly, who has read the RFC 2616 specification from end to end? I did uh, five or six times this year <laughs> uh, because I implemented the HTTP support. But I can really recommend doing that because if you're developing for the web, um, it's really interesting to know what, what is the architecture of the internet actually made of. And um, especially when you claim to, to create a REST service but have not read the HTTP, uh, HTTP specification, then you're probably doing it wrong because there are so many clever concepts in there. Actually, one, one of the guys uh, will be here on Saturday. You can ask him more about it. Flow3 tries to model that specification really um, in, a, in a meaningful way, but also if you know the spec, you know the API already. So you can uh, get a header just uh, from the request object. You can set a header if you like. Um, you could also set the last modified header in the response and just pass it a date time object because we try to make it convenient for you. You don't have to uh, deliver a time, uh, Unix timestamp or something. Everything will be converted. You can also um, retrieve the headers, of course, and then set the cache control headers. And Phil3 will make sure that um, it's all according to the specifications when that is sent. Well, you can also work with cookies. Cookies are just PHP objects. You can retrieve a cookie from the incoming request, modify it, and put it into the response again. So the, the HTTP part is really powerful, but also very simple to use if you know how HTTP works. Well, the third feature is uh, templating. Model view controller only makes sense if you actually have a view which renders the response to uh, whoever asked for it. And we created a new templating engine, which is called Fluid, because uh, we saw uh, several drawbacks in existing template engines. Uh, they were mostly insecure because they were allowing PHP, but on the other hand, they are not valid HTML markup. So you often need a plugin for your IDE that it can be nicely displayed. And Fluid is really HTML markup with extensions. It's really flexible. You can do for loops and conditions and view helpers and all kinds of that. But it's not PHP in there, so there's not so much risk. We keep it quite clean there. All right, so if we take that uh, example from the beginning and don't return the hello world directly as a string, but we use a template. We just assign the name to a view a variable. And then in the view, you can have a very simple HTML snippet like this one, hello and name in the curly brackets 
um, that would be the placeholder where the variable is displayed. So this is a simple uh, fluid template. A more complex um, scenario would be that you have a list of things you want to display. So in this case, I create a list of books. I create a new book object, put it into an array. That array is assigned to the template. And then if you look at the template, there's a for loop with some special markup. So we extend the namespace um, of HTML to have some special markup. And then you see um, it iterates over books. And then book.title uh, automatically calls a get title method on the book object in order to display the title. That's the basic idea of Fluid. It's really powerful. It's um, also supported in the existing Type of 3 CMS. And there are even uh, books about it yet. So that's our templating engine. So we have controller and view. Now what's really missing is the model. And well, if you look at some other frameworks, uh, the model is usually left out. Either you have something which is called active record, which was really popular in uh, Ruby on Rails, for example. Um, or you completely leave out the model and say that um, needs to be done by some other framework. We uh, actually, Flow 3 puts much emphasis on the model because that is the core of your application. That is where all the business logic is happening. Um, and in a regular PHP application, you end up writing a lot of infrastructure code, a lot of database-related code. So if you look at this, creating a new book in the database, first you need to check if someone who's logged in is actually allowed to do that. Um, then you need to prepare some um, database query, um, some PDO statement, and you need to do all the security considerations also, including um, SQL injection. So you write up a lot of uh, infrastructure code, and when you look at a model, it even gets worse because you don't need to read all this. It only should say that, you know, this is a book. It represents a book, and there's a method to get sales volume. I want to know how often our how much money uh, did we earn selling this book. But all the code which could fit on the screen only deals with infrastructure. You don't even get to the point where you do some business logic. And there's a principle I discovered some years ago, some five or six years ago, which is called domain-driven design. Domain-driven design um, does a lot of things, but it also lets you focus on, on the actual domain, the domain is what the problem of your software project, and it tr forces you to create really rich and meaningful domain models. Um, and because you follow that principle, you need to leave out all that infrastructural stuff because it doesn't exist in the real world. So if you create a book model and have some security code in there and compare it to the real world, in a real book there's no authentication method. Uh, unless it is about authentication, of course. So domain-driven design is a really um, helpful principle, which is really deep um, in the core of, of Flow 3. So if you look at a model in Flow 3, it is very clean. Um, this is the beginning of the model. So you have a book with a title and a price, for example. And when you scroll further down, you have a get title method, you sh certainly have a set title method, all that. And then the actual business logic could be like this. So um, you um, want to uh, query somewhere in the database, if it's even a database, um, some, some price or some total number. And for that, you send a special, um, call a special API method in your book repository. And a book repository is um, the, uh, the place which the connection to the database. If you try to code in the object-oriented world and don't think in, in terms of tables, 
And the repository has methods like add, remove, find all. Um, and that repository is actually allowed to do database queries. But by putting it into a repository class, you encapsulate everything nicely. And your controllers will never see database code or SQL statements. So we can create our own repository methods like this one, um, calculate total sales since, and then you get a time. And in there, you can actually call your database queries. If you look at an action controller, again, there you also have big advantages of, of following that principle. Creating a new book is just a matter of having a create action, which accepts a book parameter. Flow3 converts that into an object automatically. And then you add it to a book repository. And then it will be stored in a database somewhere. It will also be validated. Validation is automatically done. And there's some basis validation, but you can also configure Flow3 to uh, look at additional uh, validation rules, like uh, a valid email address and more complex rules. Well, s some code must be there to put that into a database. And we started creating our own layer for that, our own o object relational mapper. But fortunately, the Doctrine project was also working on the version 2 of um, their framework, which does just that and also follows the principles we like. So we teamed up with them and um, replaced our own persistence layer with the Doctrine layer, which is really helpful because they produce all the code. We only have to raise bug reports. Um, they write a lot of good documentation. And also, uh, it makes our project much more compatible with other projects. Well, so resources. I guess you need a coffee soon, but I'm afraid we can't stop here. Um, resources, well, if you create some plugin for CMS or you create some other functionality, then it certainly delivers some assets with it. It could be some images, some CSS files. And of course, you want that to be published on the website. But on the other hand, your packages might also contain a lot of private data you don't want to expose. And if you put all your code into a public web space, and don't take the right security measures, then people could end up reading configuration files with passwords um, and all that. So by default, Flow3 keeps all your code, everything out of the web route. There's nothing is accessible from outside. That's the default. And all the assets you deliver with your packages are mirrored to the public web folder through symbolic links. So it doesn't copy them. It just creates symbolic links. And by that, you can just um, see the web folder here is the public folder. And there you see uh, we have from the Twitter bootstrap packages, this is a symbolic link pointing to the assets of our Twitter bootstrap package. So this works nicely for static resources static assets. There's, um, of course, also a lot of data users can upload, images, for example, or PDF files, whatever. And they are stored by default also in a private directory outside the web root. And we use a SHA-1 hash uh, built of the content of that file when you upload it. Um, because if you upload that exact time, uh, file again, we'll have exactly the same SHA-1 hash and can detect, oh, we already have that image. We don't need to create another file locally. Um, of course, you never uh, deal with these files directly. Uh, in Flow3, you only work with resource objects which point to these files. And in order to publish them, um, they are also um, mirrored into the web 
public web directory and uh, then they get a file extension. And because these file names are really ugly, um, we have some rewriting rule in place. Um, you probably cannot see it from behind, but in the URL you see uh, the ugly URL with the sha one hash and then slash book-one.jpg. So the last part of the URL is actually the original file name you uploaded or anything else you want it to be. You can actually change it to whatever you like. It will always be the same file because the sha one hash is uh, the identifier. This is really useful because Flow3 has the power of publishing things and it can also publish that to content delivery network. It can use some Akamai space or it can use S3 or whatever you like and you don't need to change anything of your code because Flow3 takes care of uh, resources. What you can also do with it is uh, private downloads. So uh, have something like you can only download that PDF while you're logged in and only once because Flow3 handles um, the whole publishing process. Whoa, number six, we, are, we made uh, over the half. So who has heard of dependency inject injection? Who heard about it uh, three years ago? Not too bad, four years, someone? Five years? 10 years? 20 years? didn't exist there. Um, so just um, to, as, as a recap, dependency injection is a technique which dramatically improves um, the archi architecture of your application, of your code. Just some example. Well, who recognizes this pattern first gets a coffee from me? What's first? You were first. Singleton, right. Do you like coffee? Let's have a coffee after, after the storm. I'll ask more questions. Um, so that is the, the ugly singleton pattern. Originally, it was just called the singleton pattern. Um, so what it does is this bar class wants to make sure that it always gets the same instance of the foo class. And in order to do that, the foo class has a get instance method, which uh, stores the instance of its own class in the static variable. And there are lots of problems with that implementation. I mean, there are situations where you need to make sure that you always get the same service, like an invoice number generator. You don't want to have two invoice number generators creating invoice numbers independently. So the, the, the basic idea is great, but you cannot test that. If you write a unit test, and I hope you do. Um, you cannot test only the bar class individually. You always have to test the foo class as well because they are really hard, hard wired. And there's lots of other problems with it. Um, there's one pattern called service locator, which tries to improve that a bit. So instead of asking foo directly, you ask the service locator to get foo. But that is not really better because if you want to test that, you have to test the service locator as well. Um, or you have to have a service locator which has a special testing mode and it's really ugly. So for that, um, people invented a dependency ejection and that is really just a pattern you can use without a framework. You have a constructor here in bar and instead of letting bar getting the foo instance, you just pass it to it. You just reverse the uh, dependency. But doing that manually is cumbersome and not realistic. So there are people who say, well, dependency injection, you don't need a framework for it. Well, you do, because who passes that instance to the constructor? You don't want to do that on your own. And there are lots of different implementations and you usually have to configure the framework so it knows that bar needs foo and probably foo has some other dependencies. And again, you end up writing a lot of XML code. And as we don't like that, um, you don't need to do that. So um, we have something called property injection in this case. So you just write this 
protected foo property and use um, something which looks like a comment, but it's called an annotation. It's uh, an inject annotation, and Flow3 can read that and just make sure that um, in this property variable, you always have an instance of foo, and always the same instance. Apart from that, there's no configuration necessary. And that whole dependency injection is um, a part of something bigger. So we have object management in place, which is a bit of overhead, but in a production environment, everything is hard-coded in quite fast PHP. So while you're developing with Flow3, it's much slower than in production, because we analyze your code and all that. We don't do any code analysis in production. <coughs> we have quite some experience with that. And um, again, if you compare it to, to some other frameworks, we cover every object in your application by this object management. You don't need to register specific classes or parts of your application, because that has a lot of um, advantages. So. One, one other very powerful thing is um, you can also use third-party libraries in Flow 3 and use object management on them. Um, so because they didn't need to create any special code for it, you can just use dependency injection on a Zend, fr a Zend framework component, if you like, if it's uh, cleanly developed. All right. So that was uh, the dependency injection part. And again, uh, don't fear that because of the code analysis, things are slow. Uh, if you're interested, I can give you some, some peeks into uh, what code is actually generated. It's actually quite fast. But if you do complex things, there's also complex code behind it, even if you do that manually. Well, number seven. Aspect-oriented programming, that is usually a topic for two days. Um, I tried to do that in two and a half minutes now. So uh, aspect-oriented programming is something known in Java and some other programming languages. It allows you to modify the behavior of code uh, without touching the actual code. And why is that useful? Um, we have a security framework which allows you to um, keep people from calling methods even though those methods don't know about the security framework, we can actually modify the code of existing um, libraries, in including uh, any Symfony bundle you import or any Zen framework component. Just a very simple example. We have this greet action again, and it returns all our name. And through some aspect, we modify this method that it returns something else, but we don't change this method. So <clears throat> when you call that without an advice, you get the original method, of course, um, the, the original mes message. And if you create an aspect class with a method called some advice here, um, so you see uh, in the comment of this class, there's something around method controller greet action. So it wraps this function around the original method you specify there with some regular expression pattern. And if that pattern matches, your code is called, and you see that it retrieves the name method argument and returns something completely different than the original method. So if you have that aspect in place, uh, you see this message instead. We use that in the security framework in order to modify existing code because Type 3 has thousands, really ten thousands of extensions out there, and not all developers are so you know skilled or they are really in a hurry to to make sure that their plugins are really secure. So we thought about how can we put all the security code in a central location and make sure that even plugins which were never never had security in mind are by default secure, or at least very secure as, as much as you can do. Um, and we do that through uh, aspect-oriented programming, and there are some additional security measures. So for example, 
you have this uh, button here, create a new book. And if someone um, clicks on that, you want to keep him from, from creating actually a new book, but you don't want to implement a security check in the create action. Instead, you create a policy de definition. <coughs> so these are three steps you need to do. You define what you want to protect, that are the resources, and in this case, we protect all methods which match this uh, regular expression. The second step is to say who can poten potentially do something. We uh, define some roles which can inherit from other roles. And the third step is to actually define the rules who is allowed to do what. In this case, the administrator is allowed to call dangerous methods, which means that as soon as you specify this, everybody else cannot call that method anymore. So additionally, we protect you against cross-site request forgeries. Um, down there in, in the URL, there's some token added. So if you call that now, um, it will warn you that nobody's authenticated. This is not a very user-friendly message, but this is a, in a development context and you get an accept, access denied exception in the end. But your create action doesn't have to care about it. It just creates a book, for example. All right, almost the last topic. Um, sessions, like this session here. Um, sessions are really uh, cumbersome and also uh, can be problematic in terms of security. And sessions are extremely easy uh, to use in Flow 3. So, um, if you have that example of a shopping basket, um, what you do is you create a new model basket and you put it into a session scope. Th that is uh, what is in the square uh, on the top scope session. And then you have this method add book and that gets an annotation called uh, session auto start. That means Usually you don't have a session running, but as soon as you call add book, a new session will be started. So we can store this model in a session. You can see in the log file that um, a new session was triggered by a certain method that is really helpful for debugging. You can also see what session cookies are passed around. And then in your controller, you just use dependency injection to get that basket you just inject that basket into your controller and then in your create action, uh, I don't have the create action there, in your create action you can just call um, this basket add book and then that book is added to the basket um, and it's kind of a singleton which survives uh, the end of the request. It will be there exactly like before the next time. All right, so the last um, quick topic would be command line. Um, if you deploy things automatically or need to um, automize things, then you probably like to hear that Flow3 has very powerful support for command line. Also for development, it's really helpful. So uh, you get a help screen there, and then you can also get some, some help from, uh, for some individual commands. This command here, kickstart action controller, um, is a built-in thing which allows you to quickly create uh, a scaffolding for a new action controller so you don't have to write the initial code all yourself. And you see, we uh, try to make it really like any other Unix command with uh, lots of help information. Now, but the cool thing is if you want to have your own commands, all you have to do is uh, creating a controller and that consists mostly of uh, comments. So this is the comment of a method you have just seen, which is uh, the help text actually. And the actual action in that controller has parameters of course and they are automatically shown as arguments, optional arguments or mandatory arguments in the comment line. 
and then you do whatever you want to do in, in your actions. So you can really create, within a minute, you create a new command without having to register anything um, because we, we have that principle of not having so much configuration. So that's it. Um, if you wonder, uh, is anybody using that already or has that been implemented? We had a 1.0 release last year in October and we will have Flow 3.1.1 stable release tomorrow here at Campus Party. So if you want to join us for uh, some celebration, uh, you're welcome. Um, there are some big uh, customers, mostly in Germany, using it. Rossmann is a uh, the second biggest drugstore here in Germany, He's, they are using that for their customer database. Amadeus um, is the world's biggest e-ticket provider, they also use it for their social media suite. So we have that application platform and uh, lots of people are currently interested in it and with the Flow 3.1.1 release we also got it up to speed um, and I think that it's ready for, for anybody's project now. Just as a closing remark, we are also building a new CMS uh, for five years now. And that was the original reason why we created the Flow 3 framework at all. And we have a first release of that this year in October. So you get that very powerful combination of a CMS and a framework with really modern techniques in behind. So, I said that already. Now would be the time to take uh, some breath again and ask some questions, if you like. Also, uh, if you don't catch me now, you can ask me on Twitter or write me an email. But now I would be very happy if you have some questions. Thank you. I was probably, oh, I'm lucky. Hi, Robert. Um, one question, you've talked about, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> you've spoken about uh, the security with these uh, JAML files. Um, are users and users groups are in built features and in inbuilt features of Flow 3? Yes. Yeah, so um, in the uh, well, in the YAML files, you have seen uh, roles only roles, and uh, of, we do have the concept of users and groups, um, but they are uh, in the PHP code side. So we have an account model, which you can use. You can also inherit it. We have a person model, which uh, is kind of um, a user, if you want, and um, on top of that, we have the concept of groups. So. Uh, you can also create groups in a database uh, um, and, of course, accounts in a database. So you don't need the new Typo 3.5 to create users. You can do it with a built-in command controller. Yes, exactly. You okay. can create accounts with a command controller. Okay. That was the question. Thank you. Um, I got a question. Is it really ready for production yet? So close to the box, I think. Really ready for production? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, uh, one thing is it is used in production and um, like, like in the projects I mentioned. And also they did uh, several security reviews by um, external agencies. And I think it's fast enough. Um, we, we've been developing it for f more than five years. Um, I think it's the third iteration we had before we actually released it. Because, I mean, this is nothing you can actually do in a, in a company usually. Uh, so we took that luxury to have that big community who trusted us, hopefully, more or less. And uh, we took our time to, to have that iterations and make it really um, stable. So. If we find problems today that are mostly easy to solve bugs and uh, if we know about it, we are usually quite, quite fast to do that. Um, follow up, so what about extensions? 
Are there a lot around, or do I have to code everyone, everything by myself? Yeah, extensions. Um, so one thing I didn't mention for Flow 3.1.2, which is uh, going to be released uh, this fall, we have uh, Composer integration. So if you have heard of Composer, that is a really great package management uh, tool, which is becoming the de facto standard in the PHP community. And with that, you can also just, uh, with a simple um, command, install a Symfony component or a Zen Framework component, and of course also um, Flow3 plugins. And uh, we are currently working on a, on a package repository which makes all that visible, because there are projects running with Flow3, and they created their own extensions, but they are not visible yet, be because we don't have that platform yet. But we're working on it, and, and we try to, f to release that this fall. Thank you. Hello. Are there details for the release tomorrow? The details for what? Uh, when and where here? When, when and where? Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean, when and uh, where? The release of Flow 1.1. One, one. Flow 3.1.1. Uh, when, uh, when, when we meet, you mean? Here, yeah. tomorrow. So it's uh, tomorrow here. Somewhere. When you see people very happy with um, uh, an alcoholic-free beverage in the hand, um, jumping on a table, that's us. And we're probably here somewhere. Was that the question? You told there is tomorrow the release of Flow 3.1.1. Yes. Here. Yeah? Yeah. OK, here? Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, I just uh, you talked about elegance in a code, and you uh, I, s I saw that you put a lot of functionality into the comments. Is this a PHP thing, or why did you choose this? Sorry, I didn't get the first sentence. Okay. Can you so do this? I can. I. Th um, so I saw you put a lot of functionality into the comments and I was um, asking myself whether this would be a PHP thing or if you chose this to yourself and why. Um, yeah, th the point is uh, we don't put, uh, so the question is uh, I guess about the annotations we have in the yes. doc comments. Yeah. Um, so we have the basic rule that, I mean, this concept of annotations exists in other programming languages, uh, but we don't have the means in PHP to do that. Um, we don't want to put configuration into comments or annotations, because that could change afterwards. Um, but if it's some th something really tightly coupled to the design of your code, then it can be helpful to have it really directly next to the code, because then you don't forget updating it. No, I noticed from Python as well, but I was in Python, for example, you don't put it into the comments. So I was, why do you put it in the comments? But if you say this is a PHP thing, then yeah, it's a PHP thing. So you, we cannot extend the language or something, in that sense. But you forget about that very easily. All right. I don't see any other questions. Yeah. Are there more questions? <sighs> so, thank yeah, you thank you very Robert. much, guys. Please give him a warm applause, everyone. Coffee.